Hi, my name is Bruce Bolger. I'm founder of the Enterprise Engagement Alliance, and we're here today to do a program on effective B2B marketing practices for the 2020s. We have many of our viewers who are in the business of trying to bus develop business in the area of engagement. So we're doing this program to give people some useful information that can start applying today to better tell their story. And we're lucky to have with us today, Rachel Coger yakeley She's business strategist and consultant and a profit accelerator for just about any organization that wants to optimize its performance by identifying its true core benefits and learning how to tell that story to every key stakeholder. So thank you very much today, uh, Rachel, for joining us. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you about authenticity in the brand and how to generate business in the B2B space. Well, so thank you so much. So first off, uh, let's be honest, Rachel, uh, how many businesses that you know would have what you would call a mature B2B business development strategy? Mm. You know, to be honest with you, Bruce, it's something that a lot of B2B businesses, they, they may have a great product, a great brand, a great reputation, a great business model, good profitability factors. But going in and looking at the B2B sales process and lead gen system is something that I don't see a lot that a lot of businesses have that really understood and well-defined and a good process in place for how to do it. So in a nutshell, uh, isn't it about having a strategic and systematic approach to B2B development? In a nutshell, <laughs> that's, well, a that's just to get started. Question, as I but <laughs> it, it is about having a strategic uh, process. And a, see, the thing about B2B sales processes is that you, you want your, your whole process to be a sustainable one. Right. I mean, that's the problem that we see with a lot of businesses is that, you know, you go out and you and you do some marketing and you do some networking and you meet someone and you get a referral to someone else and you win some business and you think, oh, this is great. We're doing it right. But what's the sustainability factor of that? Right. How are you going to keep business coming in next month and the next month and the next month? Um, as opposed to the just going out and seeing what you get approach. And that's where, in a nutshell, having a process that's very strategic um, and, and process driven and, you know, spells out, this is our formula. This is how we communicate who we are. This is how we send out our signal flare to say, hey, this is who we are, and this is who we help, and this is what we're here for. And then have those people raise their hand back and say, hey, well, I'm your person, let's get together. And then have that continue to go on on a sustainable basis over the long term. And to have everyone in your organization on your sales team and marketing team and RevOps team participating in that, that's the, that's the nut, what's in the nutshell, right? That's the secret that, that it's, it's not a secret. It's not a special formula that only some people know. It's just really coming back to a strategic process, defining it clearly, knowing who you are, knowing how to communicate your own authenticity in order to attract people that believe what you believe, share the values that you share, and uh, you want to move forward in the process with you. I mean, that's it is strategic and it's a process, I will say, but it's also a, hmm, I'm going to call it a culture thing. If we can, if we can use that word in this, in this context, right. It's about your culture as more so than it is about your uh, tactical approach. So, but from everybody who's viewing this is, you know, that's great, but what do I do next? So doesn't it really start with clarifying your story? Mm. what your company really is about and how you can help. Is that the first step or a, a critical first step? Yes. In my opinion, Bruce, that is a critical first step that a lot of people miss. A lot of sales managers or sales directors that I talk to, they'll go straight to, okay, which are, what are our target accounts? Who's our target audience? How do we get in front of them, right? If you slow down in order to speed up, and you step back for a second and you think about the culture of your company and why you exist 
and why your com- what your company is here for. And it's one of my core beliefs that the purpose of business, that, that business has the, has, we have reach, we have a platform, we know people, we have thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of clients, we have business partners and suppliers, a whole ecosystem. And it's one of my core beliefs that business is and the ultimate medium to, to make a difference in the world, to change the world, to move things forward, to do things that matter, right? All of that. It's our responsibility to help our world in that way. It's one of my core beliefs. But if we back up and look at who are we? Why are we here? What are we doing here? Um, it allows us to get that clarity when we're talking to the people that we are here to help. Because otherwise, I mean, it's so easy to just be in the business world and say, this is what we do. And you write up your little elevator pitch in terms of marketing speak or business speak. And I'll tell you what, if it sounds like the marketing department wrote it, start over. <laughs> you, know? you made a really important point here that yeah. I want to pull out help. You yeah. said help. And the yeah. big issue I have um, with content that I see on LinkedIn, besides the fact that it's not systematic, it's all over the place. Very few companies are systematic. Is that it doesn't help. Isn't it the key, the first step of content, um, which is the core of this, is to demonstrate your willingness to help? Could you tell us a little bit more about the importance of content? Should we be selling or should we be helping? Yeah. Well, I mean, content... Content, let's back, let's roll that back into culture and then content, right? And the mission of the business to help your audience, to help your people. What are you helping them do? What are you helping them solve for? I, I saw, um, you know, the company Slack. Of course. The company that, you know, you can, you can message each other, stay in touch, stay in communication, people in your company, people outside your company. It keeps people in touch, Right. On Slack's website, the main banner on their website, this has been a couple of years ago, a couple of iterations of their brand, but they had a picture of Mars and they had their headline that said, now this is a a tech software. This is like a, a, a technology keep in touch SaaS model, right? Where their headline could have been like, um, keeping you know, chat with your team, stay in touch, like all of those benefits. But instead of features and benefits, they focused on the software that puts robots on Mars, right? And so what they were really implying there is we care about important critical missions. We care about teams that need to do big things, that need to solve these huge, you know, these huge problems. Like they were positioning their culture to say, we know what you're doing is important. It's very important. We want to be here to help you do that, right? They, they understood their culture. They understood, they had clarity on what they were here to do aside from it's just the technology. I mean, think of Apple, and I know that's a, a category that everybody uses as an example, but they didn't say, we sell computers, want to buy one, right? They said, we think different. We think different. You know what I mean? For the, uh, remember their, their ad campaign, where they really, they, they took images of uh, Rosa Parks and Muhammad Ali, and they took images of people that had made a big difference in the world, and they aligned themselves with that, and they said, this is what we do. We're for the people who think different. We're for the people who want to change the world. We're for the, the troublemakers and the rebels, right? And so they were clear on their culture. And I'm tying this back to the sales, the B2B sales conversation here, because it starts with that at the corporate level. And if you, as a corporate culture, understand and can communicate your why so clearly, you put it out into the world so clearly in a way that other people can resonate, see it and resonate and respond that's what I consider to be inbound marketing. That's what I consider to be magnetic. I don't consider inbound marketing to be, let me write a blog and throw it on my website and see who comes in the door. I consider inbound marketing to be so remarkable and magnetic and so clear on your values and your culture that people who share your values and your culture say back to you, yes, I want to be part of this because I believe the same, right? Like that to me is uh, the clarity that should precede a tactical um, B2B uh, business development process because you want to use that authenticity in your communication. And that's how you attract people who are going to resonate with what you do and what you're here for. 
Well, from a practical standpoint, then your content, because then at the end of the day, whatever you're doing, it's content. Your content has to demonstrate that. You can't say it. Nobody cares that your what your mission is really at the end of the day. They care how your mission is going to help me. So isn't the core challenge about to implement your strategy? It's not just distribution, not just getting it on LinkedIn or on blog, on your blog or in your e-newsletter. It's creating content that demonstrates and proves your values, isn't it? That's the hardest part, I would think. Yes, it absolutely is. And it, it comes back to the culture of the company before it goes to the sales and marketing team, you know, writing the content. You're exactly right. I mean, when you write the content, it's about demonstrating that this is who we are at our core, right? Yeah. Yep. It's about humanizing the brand. It's about, it's about pulling, pulling out um, and connecting with people, you know, you know how um, people say, Bruce, um, I don't know how I feel about that. Have you heard someone say, I don't know how I feel okay. about that. We yeah. make our decisions based on feelings and emotions, right? We write our business plans based on strategy and logic. And yet, um, I think it was Simon Sinek who said 100% of, biz- of people are people and 100% of businesses are made up of people. And when it comes to, to understanding who we are as a company, who are we as people and how do we help people? And that is a core. I call this in, in defining this with a sales team when I go in and work with sales teams and, and corporate CEOs, I, I define this as this, we call this your signal flare because it's sending out, it's saying, hey, this is you know, being transparent and being authentic and being clear and being able to clearly communicate that, um, that's your signal flare. And if you've got a strong signal flare going into a sales process, that's where that attraction piece and that magnetic piece really works well together. So what type of, uh, to tell that story, um, how many posts say a month do you recommend for a company on LinkedIn to, and any kind of rough idea of what you think it takes to keep your story going on LinkedIn once you figured out the type of content that's going to uh, become a signal flare, if you will? Mm-hmm. Well, so, so you define that. And then when you go to LinkedIn and you start to connect with your audience, there's, there's a few different ways. I mean, there's all kinds of people teaching you, here's how to use LinkedIn to generate leads, right? And a lot of those processes. Uh, There's some good mixed in with some bad, you know, things there. And marketers are smart. They figure out how to game the system. And if we post X number of times, we're going to get X yield and it's a numbers game and all that. But to me, that's no different than a cold calling strategy from years and years ago, right? It's, It's the same general paradigm. And I like to look at LinkedIn as a, as a paradigm shift in that LinkedIn to me is not a social media platform. LinkedIn to me is not a place, a microphone for me to go yell some things out to a crowd, right? LinkedIn is a, it's a networking event. It's, a, it's speaking on a stage. It's, it's being a thought leader and it's networking with people. If you walk into a Chamber of Commerce networking event or any kind of networking event, and your goal is to give two business cards to every person in the room, you're doing it wrong, right? And that's the same with LinkedIn. I mean, you go, you go into a networking event and your goal should be to identify it through conversation and relationship, the six or seven people there that you can go ahead and that you can help. And you go ahead and you schedule a time to talk with them later about how you two can work together. That's, that's the way to network. And so when we get on LinkedIn and you're building relationships with people, um, it's number one, you, you want to post because you want to, you want to be that thought leader. You want to lead the conversations. You want to curate the industry for people who don't have time to do that. You want to provide a value there but you don't want to be a salesperson there. You want to provide that value, right? And through providing that value, people, so you want people to trust you. Trust is the currency here. And I don't know if you're familiar, I'm sure you are, Bruce, with the Edelman group who wrote the Edelman Trust Barometer. They've been doing it for the last 21 years globally, a global survey to see how uh, do consumers trust uh, businesses, uh, NGOs, government, and the media. And of course, there's been a sharp decline in trust over the last several years compared to the last 20 years. And the sharp decline in trust 
um, among businesses and government and media and all of this uh, means that consumers, when they're making purchasing decisions, and this includes B2B, they're now looking to, um, what are my peers saying? What are the thought leaders saying? And, and, tr- and according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, people put trust in a specific journalist, not a media company. Right. So journalism is is a strong area for consumer trust, um, as well as um, peers. And so we look to our peers. What are other people saying about this company? What do the reviews say? What if I Google it, if I look on Twitter, what is the conversation about this company that matters to us? But when we get on LinkedIn and we lead the conversation and be a thought leader in, in our area and provide value and help people, it it decreases the time to trust. It allows people to trust us more quickly because they can see us, they can hear us, they can engage with us, they can um, uh, participate in the conversation with us, they can ask us questions. And so it allows us to build trust a lot more quickly. So that's one really important thing uh, that I think about LinkedIn is that it's a networking event where you get to lead the conversation and build trust. But secondly, LinkedIn is also a listening tool, right? Your question to me was, how often should we post? And I think there's, there's, I definitely have an opinion about that. Um, that you know, as a corporate organization or entity, or or a salesperson or thought leader individually, we should be posting a couple of times a week at a minimum and be consistent and show up and do the things. But at the same time, it's not about quantity; it's a hundred percent about the quality and the value that you offer there. But in addition to being the thought leader and giving and showing value and showing that you are authoritative in your space. You have the tools and you're capable of guiding people around their obstacles so they can fulfill their dreams, right? In addition to that, I see LinkedIn as a listening tool where you can understand the conversation. You can listen to what your prospects are saying and you can engage with them on their posts. You can comment on their stuff, right? I mean, it's it's not just a megaphone platform. It's not just a social media. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a networking event where you can be a human and it's really hard sometimes to teach people to be human on social media or on LinkedIn because they feel like it's social media. And I, it's easy to teach people to, you know, follow business to business tactical strategies, but it's much harder to help people remember to be human. And that's really what it's about. It's about, it's about unlearning what we think we're supposed to do as business people in a business development position. We think we're supposed to do this set of things when really we have to unlearn all of that and remember that I'm a human and I'm talking to you and you're a human and we're building this relationship. So what you're really saying then is we have to stop selling, number one. (laughs) We have to start helping. And what, what type of information does my community want to hear about? Yes. What insights do I offer that could be useful to them? Yes. What can I learn from them by following them and sharing my thoughts from time to time with them? And so that really does require a lot of unlearning, Rachel, because most people in sales and marketing, they can't stop selling. In other words, they post things about themselves, about their company. We don't care about themselves or their company. Sure, you want an award. I frankly don't think people really care anymore whether anyone wins an award. There's so many awards now. It's really, how are you helping your customer? Mm. That's a really critical point. Now, if once you've developed a strategy where you're using your content to help, to curate, to share, to listen, a lot of people will say, oh, well, I can't repurpose content. But it it seems to me that we can use that same content for our e-newsletters, for our blogs, Shouldn't we really be looking at our content multidimensionally once we create once we create it? Absolutely. Um, there's no reason not to. I mean, when you create content, and and let's frame this up too, right? According to um, I, if you're familiar with story brand framework, right? You've got your and we think about a storyline where there's a hero in the story, and I think the problem a lot of business. Uh, B2B sales teams miss is they think they're the hero. They're going to come in and give a solution, save the day. That's wrong. It's dead wrong, right? The way that we've queued this up, the way we frame this up is that our client 
is always going to be the hero of their story. We're not the hero. We are the guide. We're the guide, right? Here they are. They have this vision for where they want to go with their business. They have this vision of what they want it to look like, what success looks like at the end of the day. And we come in and we say, hey, we're going to sell you something. Okay, that's not a relationship, right? First of all, when they're not worried about buying something from you, what they're worried about is how do I get to this vision I have of success? That's what keeps them awake at night. So we come in and we say, okay, we see, okay, here you are, hero, Mr. Business Owner, and this is your vision of success, but this obstacle's in your way. I've been through this before. I know how to get around that obstacle. Let me help you get around that obstacle so that you can realize your vision, so you can have this success. So at the end of the day, the conversation is about framing your, it's, it's about their success. So framing yourself up as the guide who's going to help them navigate those obstacles. So when you write content, you know, thinking about writing content, it, it comes down to understanding at the um, raw emotional level, you're the hero, your potential client, what keeps them awake at night? What if they have this vision, let's say they have a vision to grow their business and take it to, you know, exit um, or a hundred million in revenue or a billion in revenue, whatever it is. And they're lying awake at night and they're worrying about this. Well, what does that mean for them? What does it mean for their employees if they don't meet that goal? What does it mean for their family, for their health? What does it mean for uh, everyone who's invested into this business? What does it mean for the industry where problems aren't solved? Their clients, what does it mean for their ecosystem? And when you can understand that, then you can have empathy for and understand the hero, which is your prospect. And you can go in and have that conversation. Because here's the thing, people say that if you can explain someone's problem to them better than they can, they automatically trust you, right? So here we are again, back to this trust factor. And so when you're having the conversation, you're, you, the more you can dig into their problems and explain it better than they can, so they know you know what they're feeling, the trust factor is there. And then they know you know how to help them get around it. They want to work with you. They want your help to help make them the hero to solve their problem. And so when you go to write content, if you're writing content about their problems that you deeply understand and you're writing content, how to navigate their obstacles that they lie awake at night and worry about, they want your help. No, you don't have to sell yourself at that point. They're coming to you asking, help me do this because they understand that you understand how to do it. So your content should focus on the pain points and the problems and the obstacles in the way of your uh, target audience, your ideal client profile, taking them from the current state of where they are stuck to their vision of ultimate success. Now, well, Rachel, I have to interrupt you because this really begs a real issue. Yeah. Most executives, they're not journalists. They're not the, the marketing people are not trained to be journalists. Yeah. I see companies that go out and hire young, you know, millennials to run their social media who have no experience in business. There's no possible way that they can make provide real insights for yeah. the decision maker. Yeah. How do companies in fact, I personally look for business journalists to do social media for B two B. Yes, um, are businesses recognizing that the that the nature of the content is critical, and that they can't just farm that out to some little unexperienced person? You know, do they do they realize that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I think in some cases they do. And I'll tell you that it seems so easy to get a freelance writer and create some content on the side and post it and check a box. But that's it's at the end of the day, it doesn't work. That trust factor, right? The, the, in the Edelman Trust Barometer, consumers are savvy and we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They see right through that and they know if someone knows their stuff or not. They know if your content is ghost written. I mean, come on. It's not about the content. It's about the thought leadership behind it, right? My A couple of my most successful clients when it came to content strategy and inbound marketing were the clients. I remember a group down in Atlanta. This, is, this has been 10 years ago. I mean, they were leading this back when um, at the beginning, this was probably 15, maybe 12, 13 years ago, uh, the executive team sat in the boardroom around the board table, right? All the C-level people. And they said, what can we, what can we write about? 
What do you want us to share? How can we share helpful information? And we whiteboarded this together and they all took a turn writing articles and providing content to the marketing team that the marketing team could then repurpose it seven ways from Sunday, right? We could then take the marketing, uh, the blog, and we could turn it into an ebook and we could expand uh, and turn it into a slide deck for a slide share for LinkedIn. And we get a carousel uh, piece and some Instagram posts and things like that. But the original thought leadership, Bruce, came from the thought leaders in the business. And they okay. were my, they were the most successful I've seen at content marketing for lead generation. You know, uh, whenever I see uh, LinkedIn uh, campaigns with little contests and quizzes, I almost always know, oh, there's a millennial in the room. <laughs> He or she doesn't really have a clue, but uh, I'm going to come up with something. And it because it yeah. authenticity and the expertise cannot be faked. Now, it, let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are buying into these LinkedIn machines where mm -hmm. um, they promise you they're going to connect you with 20 or 30 people a, a week or month. Mm -hmm. What do you think of those strategies? Mm -hmm. Well, I think true authenticity and relationship building can't be forced, right? I, it can't be faked. Um, I think there are lots of uh, LinkedIn scams, right, going on to, to drive traffic. One way that I, and I, and another thing that you call it LinkedIn farm, another way I see people using LinkedIn is they say they understand the algorithm and, you know, the more uh, comments that you get on your post within a certain amount of time after posting, the more the algorithm shows it out to people. So they'll get together with a group of friends and say, I'll comment on yours, you comment on mine. And they get this little commenting farm going on. And I just have to laugh every time I see someone say, let's start a, a, a group, a pod, right? And do this together because I see people saying that in random groups of business people and it's not industry specific. Your target audience and my target audience are different. Why would I comment on your post? And so that your connections are all seeing my thoughts and like, it, it's just forged, right? And it's, it's not authentic. It doesn't work. Don't waste your time. Um, now where I do see uh, LinkedIn being very strategic for growing your audience and getting your message out there, your signal flare, like we talked about, is if you're using LinkedIn uh, search in Sales Navigator specifically, and you can drill into, and you understand, it starts with understanding your ideal client profile very clearly and succinctly and the emotions behind that, right? But if you understand who they are, you can drill in and you can get a list in LinkedIn of people that would be a good fit for you if they're experiencing the problems that you solve. And so you can get a very targeted list. And from there, you can you can uh, comment, you can follow these people. Uh, you can put them in your sales navigator in LinkedIn and you can see put when they post. You can provide a thoughtful response. You can show up and be of value and be helpful to these people who are your ideal client profile or ideal client audience. And, and you show up to the game there. You show up at the table. You show up to network. You show up to be of service. And you can make a lot of progress that way in your ideal client profile, right? They, Within they your- you. They get to know you. They see that you're commenting. Yes. Uh, yep. And it decreases that time to trust among the people who are your buyers. So I, I don't want to say a blanket statement, you know, um, don't use LinkedIn to just go connect with a bunch of people and, and, you know, all of that, but use it strategically where you're specifically targeting your audience. And, and earlier we talked about posting on LinkedIn and how often, and I want to go back to that here and say that there's, you know, the, the posting and getting your message out and then the listening, this is a good way to do that. When you know who your audience is on LinkedIn and you're reading their posts and you're commenting thoughtful things and engaging in conversation on their posts, that can be more effective sometimes than you writing some big, long piece of content for your own uh, LinkedIn post. Now I have my approach. What I teach people is to do both, but I teach to listen first, post second, right? It's more important to listen and engage with people and show up and be of service than it is to just broadcast you, your, your message um, from the hilltops. But, um, but that's my opinion about the, about the LinkedIn systems and farms and things like that is you can't compromise authenticity and you can't compromise direct relationships with human to human. 
And that's what you have to understand that you can do on LinkedIn, that it's not just a technology platform or a social media megaphone, but it is a relationship building tool. So Rachel, uh, coming to the end of the, close to the end of the program. So I've got my story down. I've got my unique selling benefits down. I've got a content strategy that uses uh, useful information, insights, uh, curates, shares information. Uh, maybe every once in a while we post a short little video to break it up. Um, we do our e-newsletter. We take that content. We put it on our blog. We take that content. We use it in our e-newsletters. Yes. We track who opens up our e-newsletters and get a sense of what's interesting to them. Yes. What can I expect from an inbound strategy? Um, will I get leads? Will I get uh, inquiries? How will it affect my business if I do all of that right? Absolutely. I mean, there's um, if, if you're doing this well, and your team is trained to do this well, this will grow your business. Um, number one, it grows faster because you decrease your time to trust, right? So you're decreasing the length of your sales cycle. Uh, number two, people connect with people. I'll give you an example. Um, on LinkedIn, I had posted on the anniversary of my dad's death, I'd posted a picture of him and a little write-up about um, my dad and, and something I had learned. Well, it was a very personal post, right? It wasn't anything about my business. It was a, just a human, human post. Um, I had a lot of engagement on that post. It was, it was five or seven times greater than other posts. So, you know, it got some traction there, but there were a couple of comments from people that I hadn't met before. They were second level connections. And then one man uh, posted and said, wow, I'm not sure what to say. I just, I don't usually comment on these things. I just felt I needed to, to acknowledge that this, this made me feel really good. And I got a message from him in my private messages later. And he said, you know what, after I saw your post, I decided to go check out your profile. And I, and I think that you're the company that can help me with my company's goals. And I, I want to tell that story just to say that when you, when people trust you and see you as human, and it decreases that time, it decreases that time to trust, you build a special relationship. And when you're able to send out that signal flare, number one, you connect with people who share, I want to say share your values, but that sounds a little bit just like marketing speak. But what I really mean there is people who, whose heartstrings are pulled by the same thing as yours, people who's bat, who value the same things as you, people who are, 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 have the same uh, paradigms as you. And it's not always, you're not always looking to only do business with people who think exactly like you. But my point is they trust you faster because they believe in you because they understand what you believe. And that increases, number one, decreases the length of your sales cycle. And number two, Bruce, um, what we found is that increases the quality and uh, of your leads that are coming in, of your opportunities, and we see those contracts close at a higher rate than uh, contracts that come in through cold calling or cold emailing or some of these more traditional business development strategies. There's a greater trust factor. They're willing to invest more with your company because of that. They last longer. They tell more people about your company and send you more referrals. They stick with you for the long term. The lifetime value of that client is greater. So what can people expect if they, if they have a strategy in place that's based on a foundation of authenticity and, and human to human um, awareness? I, I think you can expect to get greater um, and greater revenue, increased profitability, greater company culture, because number one, I'm going to have more fun working with people who get it and appreciate what I do. We have more fun together. We are more productive together. Uh, you know, it just creates a, an environment that I want to be part of in business versus a traditional model. And if you especially think about the sales process and traditional models, it's a tough game to play. Who wants to play that game day in and day out and constantly have to be feeding the monster, right? To be able to show up and, and be yourself and be human and connect with people and have fun doing it and find the people that really need your help that you really can help and to do it together. Oh my goodness. It's a game changer. Well, not only in sales and revenue, but as a company culture, right? It's a game changer. 
Well, and that's why I think the other key advice is that you've got to involve your salespeople in this process. Yes. You cannot separate them. They've got to know what's being posted. They've got to feel willing to come up with ideas, suggestions. Yes. They've got to share the content. If there's a blog post, they've yes. got to be sharing it. Uh, so that's a whole other story. And we don't have time to go to it because the last question before we close is, Rachel, could you please give us a quick soundbite as to what your company does? Oh, well, thank you for asking, Bruce. Um, I've worked in the B2B uh, sales and marketing and revenue ops space for about 20 years now. Um, currently, my company, uh, I have a consulting firm and we consult clients, uh, corporate CEOs, as well as their sales teams. I produce courses for entrepreneurs, but at the corporate level, um, train sales teams and consult with CEOs. And a lot of, you know, what we talked about here, I've, I've done this for myself. A lot of the, the clients that I work with and the ones I love to work with are businesses of purpose, businesses with missions that are beyond revenue. Um, and so I work with a lot of really cool people who, uh, who give a damn. Right. And I feel like because I got clear on this is this is what I want to do and this is who I want to work with, sent out my signal flare. This is who I've been able to attract in my business. So I I do offer sales training for sales teams to help develop this strategy and get this process on point. I help companies write their brand story so that they're really clear on what that signal flare communicates. And then I have courses for entrepreneurs as well to be able to have access to these C-suite strategies as they're getting their business up and going and developed and launched. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and uh, I've known you for years and I know you deliver all of your promises. So just a little uh, tribute here to our, the EEA sponsors in closing that help us bring this education to you and to make everybody aware, of course, that we have all sorts of free information to help everybody profit from engagement across the enterprise. And Rachel, thanks for giving uh, some of your valuable uh, time and expertise today to share with our audience. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Bruce. I enjoyed the conversation with you as always. Same here. And we look forward to another program on the EEA. Sounds great.